Sometimes when we are performing a meta-analysis, we have studies that report data separately for two or more independent subgroups. By independent subgroups, I mean that the people uh, in the study appear in one subgroup or the other, but not both. So for example, we might have um, a study that reports the impact of an intervention treated versus control, and it reports that separately for males and separately for females. Or we might have a study that reports the impact of a drug treated versus control, and it reports that separately for patients that had stage one illness and separately for patients that had stage two illness. The critical thing is that the subgroups are independent. Uh, people appear in one subgroup or the other, but not both. So people are either males or they're females. They're e they either entered the study with stage one or stage two illness so that you don't have the case that the same people appear in more than one subgroup. That is a separate case and we will be dealing with that in a separate video. Um, my goal over here is to discuss uh, how to do the analysis. Um, I'm going to show you first how to do the analysis uh, using comprehensive meta-analysis. Then I'm going to show you how to do the analysis in Excel. Um, and so that you can get a sense, first of all, of what the issues are and, and, and separately um, how to actually perform the analysis. What we're going to be seeing is that there are two separate ways, two options that you have. Uh, what we're looking at over here is we have study A, study B, and study C. Within study A, the, the impact of the intervention is reported separately, let's say, for females and for males. Within study B, we have a line for females and one for males, and then the same within study C. We have one of the options is that we can simply treat each of the subgroups as though it were a separate study. So in this example, uh, we would have basically six uh, lines. Each line is being treated as though it's a separate study, and we combine those and get an overall summary effect. That's one option, and we call that using subgroup as the unit of analysis. A separate option is to take the two results within study A, the two subgroups within study A, and merge them to get a single estimate for study A. And similarly, then, we merge the two subgroups within study B to get a single estimate for study B, and again for study C. We then end up with three independent estimates, and we combine those three to get a summary effect. Um, let me show you how you would use either option, and then we can talk about which option is appropriate in which, uh, in which cases. I've opened up a copy of CMA. I'm going to say insert a column for study names, insert a column for subgroups within study, and remember subgroups within study means independent subgroups within the study. I'm going to say insert a column for effect size data, we can have any kind of effect size data in here. For example, we can enter means and standard deviations for each of the subgroups. We can enter uh, events uh, over n for each of the subgroups. I'm going to keep this as simple as possible. I'm going to assume we've already got an effect size and variance for each one of these. That's hedges g. And so for each one, I'm going to enter hedges g and its variance. Uh, the first study we're going to call study A, and we want two rows for that study because we have two subgroups. The first subgroup is females. The next one is males. The hedges G value is going to be 0.3 for the females and 0.1 for the males. The variance is going to be 0.05 and 0.05. There's no need for the variance to be the same, but it's going to make my examples a little bit easier and the effect direction is simply going to be automatic, which means that we're going to pick up the sign from hedges G. I can do the same thing for the remaining studies. I want to enter five studies altogether. These, by the way, are the studies that we're picking up from the book, Introduction to Meta-Analysis. Um, but an easier way to do that is to say, insert a new study. Uh, we're going to call the next one study B. Add a row for every subgroup within the study. The program already can recognize that there are two subgroups for each study, so we're going to say OK. And now I have um, study B. We're going to add study C. We're going to add study D. And we're going to add study E. So we have five studies. I'm going to close this. Um, the effect sizes are going to be 0.2 and 0.1 with variances of 0.02 and 0.02. 
For study C, the effect sizes are 0.4 and 0.2 with variances of 0.05 and 0.05. For study D, the effect sizes are 0.2 and 0.1 with variances of 0.01 and 0.01. And for study E, the effect sizes are 0.4 and 0.3 with variances of 0.06 and 0.06. In every case we're going to say that the direction is automatic and at this point we have our database. I'm going to make one more change since we're only going to be working with hedges G over here. I'm going to right click on this set of yellow columns. I'm going to say customize this. I'm going to remove the, the difference in means, the row difference in means, and the standardized difference in means. So we have only hedges G. This is a little bit more compact. I'm going to save this and I'm going to call this um, basic data and come back over here. So at this point we have our database, five studies, um, two subgroups for each study. I can click over here and the program will um, recognize that the subgroup structure and simply display this as a single line which doesn't have any impact on the analysis. It makes it a little bit easier to see. When we go to run the analysis, first up we're going to take a look at the case where we really don't care about the difference in the um, between males and females. We simply want to know whether the intervention works or not. And we have two options. If I click Run Analysis, by default the program is going to run an analysis that treats each row uh, basically as a separate unit of data. This, In this case we're using subgroup as the unit of analysis. So we see that we have over here 10 rows of data. The overall effect is 0.185, the variant is 0 0.002. Alternatively I can click on this, say select subgroup within study, and over here I can say use study as the unit of analysis. I click OK, and now what the program has done is it's taken the two subgroups within each study, combined them to yield a single study, and synthesized those. So now we have five rows of data rather than ten. Again the overall effect is 0.185 and the variance is 0.002. The first thing I, I want to point out is that the variance is the same in both cases because the amount of information that we're using is identical in both cases. If I come back here for a second and use subgroup as the unit of analysis and we come over here, click on show the weights and then I'm going to right click over here and say show the raw weight. Uh, remember that we can think of weight as the amount of information that's captured by each uh, study, or in this case by each subgroup. When we break this down into separate subgroups, and let's say we look at study A, the weight, the amount of information that we have in the female subgroup is 20, the amount of weight that we have for the males is 20, and when we end up, when we add up all the weights, we get some total amount of information that yields a, 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 uh, a variance for the um, for the entire set of data of 0.002. That's how precise this estimate is, if you will. So this is 20 and 20. If we right click on this and change it so that we use study as the unit of analysis, rather than 20 and 20, the amount of information that we have is now, it's the same, it's now 40 because basically this study initially contained 20 plus 20 as the amount of information now it contains 40 as the amount of information. The amount of information hasn't changed, which is why the variance of the total estimate has not changed. Uh, this might seem like a, uh, an obvious point, but I am um, I sort of wanted to make it very clear because we're going to see that when we move on to other kinds of, um, of complex data sets, uh, this is not necessarily going to be the case. Something else that I should point out is that since the effect size and the variance are the same whether we do it this way or whether we do it this way, you might be wondering why it makes a difference. Well, the answer is, it, uh, in this case, 
we're going to get exactly the same answer because we're using the fixed effect model. Uh, all of the um, the variance that we're looking at is variance within studies or variance within um, subgroups, and therefore it doesn't really matter whether we uh, we take we we take the mean of ten, or whether we take uh, we combine um, two and two and two and so on to get five units and then take the mean of those. We're going to end up with the same amount of information either way. However, the situation is different if we turn to the random effects model. And um, in this case, uh, there is no between study variance. I've just set this up to be a very simple example. But if there's also between study variance, then it's going to make a difference whether we uh, do a synthesis of the, of the 10 rows of data or whether we first collapse this into five rows of data and do a synthesis on that. Remember that the idea of a random effects analysis is that the dispersion and effect sizes across the lines in our analysis are used to estimate the dispersion and effect sizes in the population. So what we want to do is to, is to, is to use either the, the subgroups or the studies as representative of what the dispersion actually looks like. And uh, one example would be if we have um, five researchers and each of those researchers chose two schools at random from, let's say, from across the country and uh, tested their intervention in those schools. So in this case, we have the option of using schools or subgroups as the unit of analysis or using study as the unit of analysis. Here it makes more sense to use schools or subgroups as the unit of analysis because that would be a better estimate of how much the effect varies from school to school. Uh, on the other hand, let's assume that we have five studies. In each case, um, the researcher uh, went to a single school and within that school took two classes and did the analysis, uh, did, uh, tested their intervention in each of those classes. Well, in this case, if what we're trying to figure out is how much the uh, intervention, how much the impact of the intervention might vary from, um, from school to school, we, it might be reasonable to assume that within a school the impact of the intervention is going to be fairly similar from class to class. Uh, by contrast, the impact of the, of the intervention might be expected to vary quite a bit from school to school. So if what we're trying to do is to get a, an estimate of how much the uh, impact varies from school to school, what we probably want to do is to have uh, within each school, we're going to merge those two estimates to get an estimate for the school. Then we will have five estimates of the intervention, each one representative of a school sampled at random, and then use that to get our estimate of the dispersion and to compute to a square and then the weights and so on. So the basic I idea is that if, um, is, is that the decision to use subgroup as the unit of analysis or to use study as the unit of analysis depends on, um, on the data and which one of these is going to more closely represent the, um, the dispersion that we are trying to, uh, to estimate. Let's take a look at that same data in Excel. I have over here a column for the study, the subgroup, the effect size, and the variance. So for example, we have study A, females, the effect size is 0.3, the variance is 0.05, study A, males, the effect size is 0.1, the variance is 0.05, and so on. In order to perform a meta-analysis, and we're working over here using subgroup as the unit of analysis, I need a column f with the weight for each study and with the effect size times the weight for each study. So for male, from sorry, for females in study A, the weight is going to be equal to 1 divided by the variance. The effect size times the weight is going to be equal to the effect size times the weight. I can copy that to each of the other subgroups. I need to sum this column. I need to sum this column. And basically, once we have these two numbers, 413, which is the sum of the weights, and 76.6, which is the sum of the effect size times the weights, that's all the information that we need to complete the analysis. The mean effect is going to be equal 
to the sum of this column divided by the sum of the weights, it's 0.185, which is the same number that we saw in CMA. The variance of this value is going to be equal to 1 divided by the sum of the weights, it's 0 0.002, which is the same value we saw in CMA. The standard error is simply going to be the square root of the variance. The z-value is going to be equal to the mean divided by the standard error, 3.0. 771 and then uh, we can get the p-value using a function which is built into Excel if you're using uh, the most recent version of Excel 2010 that function if I click on this you can see it up here if you're using an earlier version of Excel there's a very similar function the two-tailed p-value is 0 0.000163 so this is basically the analysis that we did in CMA when we used subgroup as the unit of analysis. Let's try this again, but this time we're going to use study as the unit of analysis. The first step is to perform a meta-analysis on the two subgroups within study A, the males and the females, to get an overall estimate of the effect for study A. As always, what we need uh, is to get the sum of the weights and the sum of the effect size times the weight. So for study A, the sum of the weights is going to be equal to this weight plus this one. The sum of the effect size times the weight is going to be equal to this plus this. Once we have the sum of the weights, in this case it's only two, and the sum of this column, the effect size for study A is going to be equal to this divided by this, and the variance is going to be equal to one divided by this. The effect size is 0.2, which as you would expect is the mean of 0.1 and 0.3 since they both had the same weight. The variance for the combined effect is 0.025, which is exactly half the variance that we see for either row alone. Since we have twice as much information, the variance is only half as large. I can take what I did over here for study A and copy it to study B, C, D and E. So at this point we have so at this point we have five effect sizes and five uh, in each one with its with its variance. What we want to do now is to perform a meta-analysis on these on these five uh, estimates of the effect and we do it the same way that we always do. We want to get the weight for the first study is going to be equal to 1 divided by the variance. The effect size times the weight is going to be equal to the effect size times the weight. And I'm going to copy this to the, here for study 2, study 3, study 4, and study 5. Now obviously all that I've done over here is I've recreated these two columns over here. And I could have done the meta-analysis working with these two columns, but I'm simply trying to show you how the process plays out. The last thing that we need to do is to take the sum of this column from here to here. and the sum of this column and the sum of these numbers is the same as we saw over here and the sum of these numbers is the same as we saw over here which of course is exactly what you would expect the mean uh, same formulas as before the mean effect is going to be equal to the sum of this divided by the sum of this the variance is going to be equal to one divided by the sum of the weights. The standard error is going to be equal to the square root of the variance. The z-value is going to be equal to the mean divided by the standard error. And the p-value, again, is this formula over here. So what we're seeing is that it doesn't matter if we do the analysis using 10 rows or if we combine the 10 rows into 5 and do the analysis on the 5 rows as long as we're using the fixed effect analysis, so all the weights are the same, we're going to get exactly the same result. 
I should point out one more thing over here. In this uh, example in Excel and also the example that we used in CMA, the way that we combine information from the different subgroups to get an overall estimate for each study was to perform a, uh, a fixed effect meta-analysis on the subgroups within the study. CMA actually used as a slightly um, different procedure in some cases depending on what kinds of information were provided. Um, it's probably easier just to refer you to the book, but the 30-second version is this. If you have provided the mean, standard deviation, and sample size for each subgroup within the study, CMA can actually go back and uh, sort of recompute the um, means, standard deviation, and sample size that you would have gotten if you had originally done the analysis using all of that information together uh, rather than uh, dividing it into subgroups. And uh, that's what it does. It recreates the, the raw data, as it were, and then computes the effect size for that. Similarly, if the information allows a CMA to recompute the two-by-two two tables for each subgroup, CMA will then go ahead and recompute the two-by-two two table that would have been reported if the data had never been divided into subgroups in the first place. So if either of those two things is an option for any particular study, that's the option that CMA is going to use. If those are not options, then CMA defaults to the uh, procedure that we've shown over here, which is to compute the effect size and variance for each subgroup, and then combine them using uh, a meta-analysis. In general, the differences between the th these methods are going to be quite small, but um, in CMA we're trying to use uh, the most um, appropriate method possible. And there's one additional uh, thing that I, I probably um, can suggest over here, which is that even if you're planning to run the analysis using study as the unit of, um, of analysis, it is generally going to be a good idea that before you do that, you actually want to look at this using subgroups as the unit of analysis. And if we come back over here, we can um, group by subgroup within study. And we can look at this. And in this case, it turns out um, that the overall effect for uh, females is 0.24. The overall effect for males is 0.12. Um, if what you're planning to do is basically to ignore differences between males and females and come up with an overall effect, it's generally useful to go back first and see if, in fact, the effect is uh, very uh, similar for males and females. If it should turn out that these effects are quite different, then you probably don't want to overlook the differences, and you probably want to actually use subgroup as the unit of analysis and present the data separately for each one. If it turns out that the effects are essentially identical, then uh, you're not really losing a lot of information by combining the effects within, um, within, uh, within each study. To this point, our interest has been primarily in getting an overall effect, and we really didn't care about the difference between males and females. In some cases, we're going to have a very different approach. Uh, we might uh, specifically want to know if the impact of the intervention is different for males and females. In this case, obviously, you need to use subgroups as the unit of analysis. You click Run Analysis. We have the 10 subgroups over here. Computational options, group by subgroup within the study. And the program gives us an analysis separately for females and males. I'm going to get rid of some of these lines over here just for a minute. For females, the overall estimate of the effect is 0.245 with this confidence interval. For males, it's 0.126 with this confidence interval. We can then click on Next Table. Uh, at the top, we're looking at an analysis um, based on a fixed effect analysis. At the bottom, we're looking at a fixed effects analysis, I'm sorry, within, within um, subgroups. This is using a random effects analysis within subgroups. But in this case, they turn out to be identical because the estimate of variance within the females is, is zero, and the estimate of variance within the males uh, studies is zero. And therefore, the two analyses are, are the same. Let's use the numbers down here because, in general, um, I prefer to use a random effects analysis within studies. As we saw a minute ago, the overall estimate uh, for the females is 0.245 with a standard error of 0.07. 
for the males it was 0.126 with a standard error of 0.07 when we uh, perform um, an analysis to compare this versus this based on these um, levels of precision we get a Q-statistic of 1.4 1 degree of freedom the p-value is 0.225 this would be the p-value for comparing for, for testing the null hypothesis that um, the mean effect in the population is the same for females and males in other words there's you know if this number over here was under 0.05 then using uh, the conventional levels of significance, we would say that there is um, evidence that uh, the effect size differs for males and females. Um, this p-value would be considered non-significant. And to get a better sense of what that means from a substantive point of view, we're looking at effect sizes that differ by about this much relative to this level of precision, and that's the p-value that goes with that. Now let's see what this looks like in Excel. We're starting off again with the original data. What I'm going to do is to make a copy of the 10 subgroups and put it over here. Let's call this one females and we will call this one males and since this one is females I want to get rid of this line and this one and this one and since this one is males I'm going to get rid of this line okay so what we have now is basically a meta-analysis over here based only on the five subgroups of females and we have one over here based on the five subgroups of males everything else remains the same um, the weights now are the weights for the females this column and so we get the mean for the females as 0.245 with a variance of 0.025, a standard error of 0.07, a z-value of 3.5, and the p-value is over here. Similarly for the males, the mean is 0.126, the variance is 0.005, the standard error is 0.07, the z-value is 1.89, and the p-value is over here. Let me... Um, I'm momentarily going to open up a copy of CMA to show you that the numbers actually match. For the females, we have a point estimate of 0.245, a, a variance of 0.005, a standard error of 0.07, a z-value of 3.524, and the p-value, if I format, increase the number of decimals, is three zeros followed by 424 which is the same thing we see over here this p-value of course is the p-value for testing that this value is a significant, significantly different from from zero and then for the males we have an effect size of 0.126 and this is 0.126 the standard error in both cases is um, 0.06 9, or here it's rounded to 0 0.07, the variance is 0 0.005, the uh, z value is, point, uh, is 1 uh, 1.809, and the p value is 0 0.0705. So everything is matching um, exactly. The next thing that we want to do is to uh, compare these two numbers. We want to compare 0.245 versus 0.120. So the first thing we want to do is compute the difference. And that difference is going to be equal to this mean minus this one. And that difference is 0.119. The next thing we need is the variance of the difference. And that is simply going to be the sum of the two variance. So it's going to be equal to this plus 
this. The standard error is going to be the square root of this. Point oh nine eight. The um, z value for the difference is going to be equal to the difference divided by the standard error. And the p value, again, we're going to use that function that's built into Excel. I simply can copy it from here. Is going to be uh, 0.225. Let me take a second to format this. And we have it. Let's take a quick look at the um, CMA, just to make sure that everything is working properly. And in CMA, if we come over here, we see that the p-value is 0 0.225024, 0 0.225024, so that matches exactly. The z-value is um, 1.21. Now, the z value, um, in this case, what we've done is essentially comparable to a t test. So we're working with, with um, the z test. What we're doing in CMA is we're working with uh, the q value, which is analogous to an f test. And with one degree of freedom, the, the relationship between z and q is that q is simply working with the squares. So if we wanted to convert from z to q, if we would take this value over here, the z value, and square it, we will get 1.472, which is the same number that we saw over here in CMA, 1.472. So basically what I've tried to show you over here is exactly, the, is, is pretty much the, the math that is working uh, behind the scenes when you do a, um, when you do a test comparing uh, two subgroups and those subgroups are, are independent. Uh, this math applies when we're working with indep independent subgroups within a study. It would also apply if we were comparing different studies. It's the same thing since each subgroup is independent. They, it, it basically is functioning as a separate um, as a separate study. Let me point out also that in CMA, if it were the case that you were comparing uh, three, four, five, and a number of subgroups, the Q statistic. Uh, would be uh, sort of an analysis of variance, a, a test comparing all of those uh, subgroup means, you might want then to go back and compare two groups at a time. And this is the procedure that you would use to do that. And uh, the last thing we probably should say is that over here, since, um, since at this point we actually are looking at the difference, um, it generally makes sense to put a confidence interval around the difference. Let me show you how to do that. The way that we, we would create a confidence interval, let's put a column over here for the lower limit and a column over here for the upper limit. The lower limit is going to be equal to the difference minus 1.96 times the standard error. The upper limit is going to be equal to the difference plus 1.96 times the standard error. Um, and so the lower limit is minus 0.07, the upper limit is 0.312. So what we're saying is that the difference between these two groups, between males and females, the difference in the effect size, uh, falls someplace in this range. And of course, since the range includes uh, zero, we know that difference is not going to be significant at the 0.05 level. And in fact, the p-value for it we saw a minute ago is 0.225. OK, everything that we have dealt with over here in this video um, is limited to the case where the subgroups are independent of each other so that, in effect, each one is contributing separate information and it can be treated almost as though, exactly as though it's a fully separate study. Now uh, we're going to move on to another video where we have a similar structure, but this time rather than dealing with males and females, we have maybe two outcomes, let's say math and reading, that are based on the same subjects. Or other um, 
or other kinds of structures where the, the, the different um, rows within a study are not independent of each other, where they don't provide a fully independent information. And as we will see momentarily, that is a, a very different um, situation. Uh, our website again is uh, www.metaanalysis.com. And um, thank you very much for your attention.